So now that Japan was recognized as a world power and viewed as an equal, they felt that this was a green light for them to go through and join their game of imperialism, okay? which every country in the world, every world power controlled vast amounts of territory. And Japan's first colony was Taiwan. So we, they have Taiwan already. They also have some territory in China, Port Arthur, right? And also a Japanese district in Shanghai. But they want more. Okay, they need a lot more. So Japan sets its sights on Korea, okay, and, and this was a very, very meticulous process because first they got China out of the picture, right? Then Russia's out of the picture because Russia also was interested in Korea. Now they're out. So there's, Korea is basically wide open for the Japanese to take. So they start slowly. So in 1905, Korea is declared a Japanese protectorate. So in other words, the Korean king is approached by a Japanese delegation led by Ito Hirobumi, you can see in the picture. And he's told, well, you know, we, you know you're, you, we need to keep you safe from other countries, so we're going to protect you and help you out with your foreign affairs. If you need anything, let us know. So Korea gets a new flag. Uh, this is the flag of the Japanese protectorate. You can see blue with the Japanese flag in the left-hand corner. And in 1906, Emperor Meiji sends Ito Hirobumi to Korea to act as a resident general, because since Korea is now a protectorate, of Japan. Korea needs, quote unquote, an advisor to help the Korean king and his government with their political issues. Okay? And in reality, they didn't need anyone because the Korean dynasty had been ruling since the 1300s. They didn't need any help, but it was a pretext to get Japan more involved in uh, Korean affairs. Okay, And surely enough, from 1906 to 1909, uh, Japan began controlling more and more aspects of Korean life, namely political and economic life. Okay? And Ito Hirobumi personally set off to have complete control eventually over not only the Korean government, but over its monarchy. He was acting as sort of an advisor to the Korean royal family. And you can see him pictured here with, I believe, the son or the grandson of the Korean king, um, you know, showing that he's like an advisor and helping Korea modernize, when in reality it was a pretext for colonial control. Uh, the Korean people were very upset at Japanese aggression. Naturally, they were an independent country, and there was no reason why the Japanese should feel that they could just come in and, and control them. And so this is really a birth, a surge of Korean nationalism against the Japanese. There's a lot of anti-Japanese sentiment during this time because of what's happening. And it all comes to a head in 1909. Um, a Korean nationalist named An Jung-gun assassinates Ito Hirobumi. Um, and, and this is a big deal because Ito Hirobumi was the first prime minister. He is the king of the king of the oligarchs of Satsuma and Choshu. He's been around for a long time, and he's assassinated um, by you know, this, this Korean nationalist. So Ito is immediately you know, declared dead on the scene. The country of Japan goes into mourning. The emperor himself, Meiji, was very upset. So this really infuriates the Japanese government. And so possibly out of revenge, possibly because they were planning to do it anyway, and this was a good chance to just do it and get it over with. In the year 1910, Korea is declared a Japanese colony, the second colony after Taiwan, and actually annexed to Japan. So it's made a part of Japan. That means if you were in school in 1920 and you looked at a map of Japan, like this map, you would see Japan there, you would see Taiwan, and you would see Korea included on the map of Japan. Okay. So you know it was all considered to be one country, even though these were you know, independent states. They are now added to Japan. Um, that's what colonial, colonial rule is, really. And from that, from that point on, Japan would be known as the Empire of Japan, or the Japanese Empire. That's the official title, because Taiwan and Korea were made part of Japan's territory. And, you know, there's more to colonialization than just show. Okay? They weren't just doing it because, oh, it makes us look cool. Remember from the beginning that Japan has few natural resources. Okay, they, 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 They've never been blessed with natural resources. And so the purpose of colonies is to supply these natural resources to Japan. For example, Korea was responsible for supplying inexpensive rice to the main islands of Japan to feed the Japanese people. That's the purpose of colonization. Taiwan had a lot of uh, sugar plantations. These were also sent to Japan. So it, you know, it was basically colonies were made to supply materials to the main islands. And, and this is not only the case for Japan with Korea and Taiwan, but it's really for any country uh, that had colonies. Look at India and tea, right? Um, 
cotton in other countries. You know, in Africa, you have the gold and silver mines. These, it was a, a way to exploit these countries and their materials for the sole purpose of enriching the home country, in this case, Japan. In addition to economic exploitation, Japan's policies in Taiwan and Korea were that of Japanization. Okay? Japan did not want Taiwan and Korea to feel like it was Taiwan and Korea. They wanted you to walk to any city in Korea or any city in Taiwan and to think you're in Japan. So the Japanese sent many people to live in Taiwan and Korea to move there. Hundreds of thousands of people moved to these countries to live there and to, make, to give the countries a Japanese feel. Okay? So now you see almost like a caste system in these countries where if you're a Japanese person living in Korea or Taiwan, you're at the top of the top. Okay? You're, you're the, the privileged social class. And if you're a Taiwanese and Korean living in your own country, you're now a second class citizen, even though that was your country where you were born. That's, that's, it belongs to you, but you're a second class citizen because it is now a colony of Japan. And since Korea and Taiwan were annexed to Japan, um, they want, the Japanese government wanted to erase any kind of influence that those countries had, native influence. So all Taiwanese and Korean cities were given Japanese names. Taipei was renamed Taihoku. Okay? Seoul was named Keijo. Pyongyang was renamed Heijo. Pusan was Fusan. So if you, you know, if you were traveling from the United States to Korea, you wouldn't say I'm going to Seoul. You would say I'm going to Keijo. Or if you look at old maps, you won't see Pusan, you will see Fusan. So these cities were all given Japanese names. Also, Shinto shrines were built all over Taiwan and Korea. Um, because, you know, Shintoism is a native Japanese religion and never existed in Taiwan nor in Korea at all. But they were built to give the feeling that you're, you know, if you're in Korea or Taiwan, you're actually in Japan. It's part of our country now. Uh, Taiwan still has some um, Shinto shrines that were kept... They're like historical landmarks to, you know, to commemorate or to, to uh, as, as, a, as a reminder of the, Jap of the tragedies of the colonial period. Korea, I believe, has destroyed most of their Shinto shrines after the war. Uh, speaking Korean and Taiwanese was discouraged, okay? And you were told that, especially for kids, you know, you only could speak Japanese because you're in Japan now, right? And so Korean and Taiwanese students basically are given the same education in school as a Japanese student would get in Japan, in the main islands. So you were taught to honor the emperor. All lessons were conducted in Japanese. Um, and Taiwanese and Koreans were actually pressured to take Japanese names. You had to give yourself a Japanese, you had to take a Japanese name because you're a Japanese person now. So these people are forcibly converted almost into being Japanese. And if you didn't like it, okay, um, the secret police were very, very active in the Japanese colonies. Any minor opposition to Japanese rule was brutally dealt with. You could find yourself arrested and executed or you know, spending your lives in prison for any small offense, even a verbal comment on something you didn't like. Okay. So, you know, there were, there were other, you know, there's some elements of, of colonial rule that we must look at as well. You know, modernization, Taiwan and Korea were, you know, indeed, a lot of, you know, modern buildings were built during these periods. Schools and universities were built. Um, literacy was increased among the population in both areas. Uh, but, you know, these are, these, these small achievements are a small, a, a very, very small aspect of a increasingly and very harsh and brutal colonial occupation. We're not talking five, six years. We're talking 50 years for Taiwan. It was, it was under Japanese control for 50 years and 35 years for Korea. Um, the, this was not easy, easy periods of time. This is a very, very brutal, harsh colonial occupation where uh, the, the Japanese attempt very, very strong um, an attempt to cleanse the culture of Taiwan and Korea, which was never successful, but they tried. Uh, this is actually, you know, you would think this is in Japan, but this is actually Seoul in the, during the Japanese colonial period. You wouldn't, you wouldn't know that it, it's in Korea, but you know it, that that was the whole point. The Japanese wanted to, by annexing these countries, they wanted to erase any native cultural influence. But you know, the Koreans and the Taiwanese were very, very uh, opposed to this, and they always kept their culture inside of them, even if they were persecuted for speaking out. <laughs>